In earlier videos, we explained how geography can influence GDP per capita, working through things like disease. We also explained that geography alone can't be everything, because institutions are also clearly very, very important. What we want to do today is say how geography may have an indirect effect by changing or influencing institutions. Let's go. So I'm going to focus in particular on why North America developed differently than Central and South America. And the basic story is going to be this. At the beginning, Central and South America did very well because they had a lot of geographic elements, factor endowments in their favor particularly excellent places to produce sugar and silver, and that made these places rich. However, in order to produce sugar and silver, it required them to build up institutions which later on, particularly in the 19th and the 20th century, retarded development. So these institutions which were born in the early period, the sugar and the silver period, later on retarded development and slowed down all of the things which created a rich country in the modern world. I'm going to be basing a lot of what I say on Engerman and Sokoloff, an excellent paper called Factor Endowments, Inequality, and Passive Development Among New World Economies. Let's begin with sugar. So the West Indies and much of South and Central America had great climates for sugar also for coffee, tobacco, cotton. And a lot of these places also had very productive gold and silver mines. Now what unites all of these activities is they involve large economies of scale. Sugar, for example, has never been produced on you know, small family farms or sole proprietorships. When sugar is produced, it's produced on large plantations using a lot of low skill, often slave labor. It's backbreaking, hard, hard labor. Hierarchical production, one guy at the top, a lot of low-skill, hard slave labor at the bottom. Now just to give a hint of where we're going, think about what a society born with this kind of picture that you see before you, what a society like this, how it's going to develop. Here's another factor endowment, silver. In 1672, Potosi, which is in today's Bolivia, it was one of the largest and wealthiest cities in the entire world, all because of this giant mountain in the background, which had huge deposits of silver. These deposits were mined by African native Indian slaves and uh, low-skill, low-wage laborers. And these laborers were said to have survived on average in these mines for less than a year. Over the centuries, as many as 8 million men may have died from mining accidents, from lung disease, and from mercury poisoning, which was used to process and produce the silver. So this was large-scale, industrial, hierarchical institutions based upon low-skill, low-wage labor. It was extractive institutions, literally, extracting the silver and also extracting the lives from the workers. Today, by the way, Potosi is a poor region, a poor city, in a poor country. A lot has changed. So what does this tell you about development? That's where we're moving to. Another factor endowment, at least when it came to the Europeans, frankly was people. Not their human capital, but simply people as slaves. So many of the regions in the West Indies and Central and South America had these large native populations. And European colonists looking here said, hey, these populations are going to be great for forced labor. In regions where there was resources, you know, like silver, but no labor, that's where the African slaves were imported in the millions. It's important to remember that uh, St. Martinique, which is a tiny island, this, imported, this island imported more slaves in its history than all of the United States mainly because the slaves came in, they were worked to death, and then regularly replaced. We think about slavery as being a U.S. institution, but much more so it was a Central and South American institution. When the Europeans came at this point in time, you know, in the 1500s, 1700s, they came to this region not to live, but to rule. So we think today about Latin America as having a European character, 
But as late as 1825, less than 25% of the population of Brazil was white. 55% was black, 21% was Indian. Even fewer were white in Spanish America. This idea of Latin America as having this European character, this only developed actually much later in the 19th century. So one factor endowment was the access to slave labor. Now let's compare the factor endowments of Central and South America, the three S's, slaves, silver, and sugar, with the factor endowments of North America. Let's begin with crops. So the crops produced in much of North America, grains like wheat, had low economies of scale. What this meant was is that a farmer and his family could make a living working for themselves in North America growing wheat. The same family could not produce sugar in Brazil. For that, it took a firm, a large body of labor and overseers, this capitalist production process. But you could have family farms in North America, and indeed there were millions of these family farmers. Jefferson went so far as to say that the yeoman farmer was the bedrock of U.S. civilization. And to one extent, he was right. The yeoman farmer was independent. The yeoman farmer could not be buckled uh, by the aristocrats. The yeoman farmer uh, demanded equality. This is important to remember because the aristocrats in North America, they wanted to set up a more feudal society. They wanted to uh, create the same society as they were used to in Europe. But in North America, they could not. They could not because when they tried to do this, when the aristocrats tried to create this feudal society, workers could say, take this job and shove it. They could go west. They could become a homesteader. They could get cheap land. They could become independent. And that possibility of being independent led the United States on a different growth path than Central and South America. Here's another factor endowment of people, or rather lack of them. Compared to Central and South America, there were actually relatively few natives in North America. And slaves, although incredibly important for the United States, they never made up a large share of the population, again, compared to South America and the Indies. So in 1820, for example, 80% of North America was white, less than 20% black, which is almost the reverse of Spanish America. So this meant that North America, despite inequalities, particularly with the slaves, of course, it began with much more equality, while South America began with hierarchy. Moreover, the fact that there were relatively few natives in North America, and you also didn't have this, uh, these silver mines and this sugar production, this meant that the people who came to North America, they were not the aristocrats of the day. The people who came to North America, they wanted to come here to live, not to rule, and they wanted to come here to be left alone. They were the weirdos of the day, the religious nuts of the day, the people who were trying to get away with everything which had oppressed them in Europe. These were the people who came to America uh, rather than the gung-ho type looking to make a buck who went to Central and South America. So the idea here is that the economies of scale in sugar and mining and the high demand for low-skill labor meant that the South American colonies, including Central America and the West Indies, set up highly unequal societies. You had a few wealthy European immigrants, often with very large land holdings, dominating large slave and Indian populations. Now, Angerman and Sokolov argued that these initial patterns of inequality persisted and were self-reinforcing throughout the 19th and 20th century to the detriment of economic growth. That is, societies which were born unequal were kept unequal. Let's look at literacy. So these elites based upon extractive institutions. This is a term from Asimoglu and Robinson's book, Why Nations Fail. They typically want a low wage, low education, low skill labor force. And they are willing to work to keep the labor force that way. Because a low skill labor force, it's complementary to land. 
to agriculture and to simple mining production. So the more low-skill labor, the more the landowners would benefit. And so the landowners wanted to keep the population low-skilled, low-education. A low-skilled, low-education rural workforce is also easier to control. And you can see that the elites uh, in Central and South America succeeded at this. So here are literacy rates as late as 1900. In Guatemala, we're talking 11%. Bolivia, 17%. Mexico, 22%. Brazil, 25%. And so forth. This compares with Canada, with the United States, where you're talking 80 to 90% of the population is literate in 1900. Big differences. And the differences, the point we're making, are not accidental. The differences were flowing from the nature of extractive institutions and from the incentives of these elite groups, these land-owning groups, to keep their rural workforce low educated. Same story can be told here with respect to democracy. So as late as 1900, none of the countries in Latin America had the secret ballot. Wealth and literacy requirements remained common long after they had ended in North America. In part, this is because with a less literate population, you expect democracy to take longer uh, time to arrive. A more rural population, you expect democracy to take a longer time to arrive. It also because the elites may have feared democracy. And in a way, they are probably right to do so. So think about, again about the inequality in land holding. Now the thing about land, it's very easy to redistribute. It's hard to hide land. The supply is fixed, unlike income based on human capital, and you can take it from one person and give it to another. It's harder to do that with human capital because if you start taking too much of the income of human capital, the people won't accumulate human capital any longer. So the elites, when the elites are based upon land, they may have more to fear from democracy and thus suppressed democracy a lot more than in North America. And the elites were successful at doing this. So let's think about the distribution of land circa 1900. So in Mexico in 1910, less than 5% of rural household heads own land very much coming all the way down from the 1500s and 1600s. In Argentina, about 20%. Again, compared to the United States, about 80% in 1900 of rural, household, rural households owned land. In Canada, it was 90%. Even today, hundreds of years after the colonial period, we still see a massive level of income inequality in these countries. So in Haiti, this Gini index, which is a measure of inequality, is at a really high 60. Brazil, 54. Bolivia, 57. Colombia, 58. Guatemala, 54. These are some of the most unequal countries in the world. The United States, which is actually one of the most unequal developed countries in comparison, is quite a bit less, 41. Canada down here at 33. Now, all of this inequality and suppression of education and so forth would not have mattered so much except for the fact that when we get to the Industrial Revolution, and particularly in the 19th and 20th centuries, what is driving growth is ideas. It's human capital. It's innovation, productivity, technology, and so forth. And countries with a lot of inequality had trouble developing along this path. So just think about uh, Edison. You know, he is, does not come from the elite. He is not well educated. And yet it's because of Edison and people like him that we get all of these patents, all of these new ideas, the light bulb, the very symbol of ideas coming from this uh, un less educated, non-elite person that shows you the importance of using all of your brain power. And these countries which had the, this massive inequality where the elites didn't want to take advantage of that brain power. They feared the brain power of the masses. These countries had trouble growing. And extractive institutions, they can only extract so much before they collapse. So we talked earlier about Patassi, one of the richest countries in the world, one of the richest cities in the world in 1672. 
Today it's dirt poor. You know, people are still trying to mine, scrape whatever silver they can out of those out of those mines. But it's a terrible working conditions, terrible standard of living. Bolivia, one of the poorest countries uh, in the Western Hemisphere. Okay, let's summarize the argument. So we begin with factor endowments. In South America, that was sugar, silver, uh, slaves. And these factor endowments pushed the economy towards these extractive economic institutions, economies of scale using a lot of low-wage, low-skill, often slave labor. These extractive economic institutions created extractive political institutions. That is, the suppression of democracy, the creation of oligarchies, and so forth, elites. Then these elites choose to maintain their power. They choose policies to maintain their power, to keep those workers low skill, to keep them low education. And remember, when you're at the top, when you have a political system which is dominated by people at the top, these people, they don't want creative destruction. That's likely to destroy them. They don't want anti-innovation. They don't want innovation, rather. They're anti-innovation. Because when you're already rich and powerful, innovation is primarily a threat to your position. So you passed policies which suppress technology, which suppress entrepreneurship, which suppress creative dis destruction. You want to keep instead your uh, laborers, low skill, low education, make your rents from that land. So these elites choose the policies to maintain power. This, cre uh, this uh, su further supports these extractive economic institutions, which support the extractive political institutions, and so forth. Now, by the way, we started the story off with factor endowments. But in different places, in different parts of the world, at different times of history, we could equally well have started the story with differences in history or even with differences in random events, chance events. The point here is that small factors, fairly small factors, once they start you going on this circle, the circle becomes very difficult to break out of. That's why it's a vicious circle. That, why, that, that is why it can take hundreds of years once this circle has begun, once these institutions have been put into place. It can take hundreds of years to break out of this circle, even when breaking out of this circle would ultimately be to the benefit, to the great benefit of the mass of the population. Thank you very much.